Radio astronomy is a subfield of astronomy that studies celestial objects at radio frequencies. The initial detection of radio waves from an astronomical object was made in the 1930s, when Carl Jansky observed radiation coming from the Milky Way. Subsequent observations have identified a number of different sources of radio emission. These include stars and galaxies, as well as entirely new classes of objects, such as radio galaxies, quasars, pulsars, and masers. The discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation, regarded as evidence for the Big Bang theory, was made through radio astronomy. Radio astronomy is conducted using large radio antennas referred to as radio telescopes, that are either used singularly, or with multiple linked telescopes utilizing the techniques of radio interferometry and aperture synthesis. The use of interferometry allows radio astronomy to achieve high angular resolution, as the resolving power of an interferometer is set by the distance between its components, rather than the size of its components. History Before Jansky observed the Milky Way in the 1930s, physicists speculated that radio waves could be observed from astronomical sources. In the 1860s, James Clerk Maxwell's equations had shown that electromagnetic radiation is associated with electricity and magnetism, and could exist at any wavelength. Several attempts were made to detect radio emission from the Sun including an experiment by German astrophysicists Johannes Wilsing and Julius Scheiner in 1896 and a centimeter wave radiation apparatus set up by Oliver Lodge between 1897 to 1900. These attempts were unable to detect any emission due to technical limitations of the instruments and the discovery of the radio reflecting ionosphere in 1902 led physicists to conclude that the layer would bounce any astronomical radio transmission back into space, making them undetectable. Carl Jansky made the discovery of the first astronomical radio source serendipitously in the early 1930s. As an engineer with Bell Telephone Laboratories, he was investigating static that interfered with short-wave transatlantic voice transmissions. Since the signal peaked about every 24 hours, Jansky originally suspected the source of the interference was the sun crossing the view of his directional antenna. Continued analysis showed that the source was not following the 24-hour daily cycle of the sun exactly but instead repeating on a cycle of 23 hours and 56 minutes. Jansky discussed the puzzling phenomena with his friend, astrophysicist and teacher Albert Melvin Skelet, who pointed out that the time between the signal peaks was the exact length of a sidereal day, the timing found if the source was astronomical, fixed, in relationship to the stars and passing in front of the antenna once every Earth rotation. By comparing his observations with optical astronomical maps, Jansky eventually concluded that the radiation source peaked when his antenna was aimed at the densest part of the Milky Way in the constellation of Sagittarius. He concluded that since the Sun were not larger, meters of radio noise, the strange radio interference may be generated by interstellar gas and dust in the galaxy. Jansky announced his discovery in 1933. He wanted to investigate the radio waves from the Milky Way in further detail, but Bell Labs reassigned him to another project, so he did no further work in the field of astronomy. His pioneering efforts in the field of radio astronomy have been recognized by the naming of the fundamental unit of flux density, the Jansky. After him, Grote Reber was inspired by Jansky's work, and built a parabolic radio telescope 9 meters in diameter in his backyard in 1937. He began by repeating Jansky's observations, and then conducted the first sky survey in the radio frequencies. On February 27, 1942, J.S. 
Hay, a British Army research officer, made the first detection of radio waves emitted by the sun, at Cambridge University, where ionospheric research had taken place during World War II. D.A. Ratcliffe along with other members of the telecommunications research establishment that had carried out wartime research into radar created a radio physics group at the university where radio wave emissions from the sun were observed and studied. This early research soon branched out into the observation of other celestial radio sources and interferometry techniques were pioneered to isolate the angular source of the detected emissions. Martin Ryle and Anthony Hewish at the Cavendish Astrophysics Group developed the technique of Earth rotation aperture synthesis. The Radio Astronomy Group in Cambridge went on to found the Mullard Radio Astronomy Observatory near Cambridge in the 1950s. During the late 1960s and early 1970s, as computers became capable of handling the computationally intensive Fourier transform inversions required, they used aperture synthesis to create a 1 mile and later 5 kilometers effective aperture using the 1 mile and Ryle telescopes, respectively. They used the Cambridge interferometer to map the radio sky, producing the famous 2C and 3C surveys of radio sources. Techniques Radio astronomers use different techniques to observe objects in the radio spectrum. Instruments may simply be pointed at an energetic radio source to analyze its emission. 2. Image a region of the sky in more detail. Multiple overlapping scans can be recorded and pieced together in a mosaic image. The type of instrument used depends on the strength of the signal and the amount of detail needed. Observations from the Earth's surface are limited to wavelengths that can pass through the atmosphere. At low frequencies, or long wavelengths, transmission is limited by the ionosphere, which reflects waves with frequencies less than its characteristic plasma frequency. Water vapor interferes with radio astronomy at higher frequencies which has led to building radio observatories that conduct observations at millimeter wavelengths at very high and dry sites. In order to minimize the water vapor content in the line of sight, finally, transmitting devices on Earth may cause radio frequency interference. Because of this, many radio observatories are built at remote places. Radio telescopes Radio telescopes may need to be extremely large in order to receive signals with high signal-to-noise ratio. Also since angular resolution is a function of the diameter of the objective in proportion to the wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation being observed. Radio telescopes have to be much larger in comparison to their optical counterparts. For example, a 1 meter diameter optical telescope is 2 million times bigger than the wavelength of light observed giving it a resolution of roughly 0.3 arc seconds, whereas a radio telescope dish many times that size may, depending on the wavelength observed, only be able to resolve an object the size of the full moon. Radio interferometry The difficulty in achieving high resolutions with single radio telescopes led to radio interferometry, developed by British radio astronomer Martin Ryle and Australian engineer, radio physicist, and radio astronomer Joseph Laid Pawsey and Ruby Payne Scott in 1946. Surprisingly, the first use of a radio interferometer for an astronomical observation was carried out by Payne Scott. Pawsey and Lindsay McCready on 26 January 1946 using a single converted radar antenna at 200 MHz near Sydney, Australia. This group used the principle of a sea cliff interferometer in which the antenna observed the sun at sunrise with interference arising from the direct radiation from the sun and the reflected radiation from the sea, with this baseline of almost 200 meters. The authors determined that the solar radiation during the burst phase was much smaller than the solar disk and arose from a region associated with a large sunspot group. The Australia group laid out the principles of aperture synthesis in their ground-breaking paper submitted in mid-1946 and published in 1947.
The use of a sea cliff interferometer had been demonstrated by numerous groups in Australia, Iran and the UK during World War II, who had observed interference fringes from incoming aircraft. The Cambridge group of Ryle and von Berg observed the sun at 175 MHz for the first time in mid-July 1946 with a Michelson interferometer consisting of two radio antennas with spacings of some tens of meters up to 240 meters. They showed that the radio radiation was smaller than 10 dark minutes in size and also detected circular polarization in the type 1 bursts. Two other groups had also detected circular polarization at about the same time. Modern radio interferometers consist of widely separated radio telescopes observing the same object that are connected together using coaxial cable, waveguide, optical fiber, or other type of transmission line. This not only increases the total signal collected, it can also be used in a process called aperture synthesis to vastly increase resolution. This technique works by superposing the signal waves from the different telescopes on the principle that waves that coincide with the same phase will add to each other while two waves that have opposite phases will cancel each other out. This creates a combined telescope that is the size of the antennas furthest apart in the array. In order to produce a high-quality image, a large number of different separations between different telescopes are required. As many different baselines as possible are required in order to get a good quality image. For example, the very large array has 27 telescopes giving 351 independent baselines at once. Very long baseline interferometry beginning in the 1970s. Improvements in the stability of radio telescope receivers permitted telescopes from all over the world to be combined to perform very long baseline interferometry. Instead of physically connecting the antennas, data received at each antenna is paired with timing information, usually from a local atomic clock and then stored for later analysis on magnetic tape or hard disk. At that later time, the data is correlated with data from other antennas similarly recorded, to produce the resulting image. Using this method it is possible to synthesize an antenna that is effectively the size of the Earth. The large distances between the telescopes enable very high angular resolutions to be achieved much greater in fact than in any other field of astronomy. At the highest frequencies, synthesized beams less than 1 milliac second are possible. The preeminent VLB IRAs operating today are the very long baseline array in the European VLB I network. Each array usually operates separately, but occasional projects are observed together producing increased sensitivity. This is referred to as global VLBI. There are also a VLBI networks operating in Australia and New Zealand called the LBA, and arrays in Japan, China and South Korea which observe together to form the East Asian VLBI network. Since its inception, recording data onto hard media was the only way to bring the data recorded at each telescope together for later correlation. However, the availability today of worldwide, high-bandwidth networks makes it possible to do VLBI in real time. This technique was originally pioneered in Japan, and more recently adopted in Australia and in Europe by the EVN who perform an increasing number of scientific EVLBI projects per year.